Hello and welcome. My name is Reverend Philip Shanker, and this is our introductory lecture series on the Divine Principle. In our earlier presentations, we covered a vast number of topics and thousands of years of human history, beginning from the clear blueprint of the principle of creation, God's purpose for human beings and the whole of creation. Then through a deep insight into the human fall, how the contradiction arose in human beings, and the tradition of false love that's been passed on to successive generations. Based on these perspectives, we began to look at the process and providence of restoration in history. How a loving, wise, and almighty God has worked to restore his original ideal and fulfill his purpose of creation, working in and through the events of human history. Not by manipulating and controlling events and outcomes, but through the providence of restoration. We saw the integral role of human responsibility in the same way as our first human ancestors disobeyed God's commandment. Likewise, when God calls a chosen central figure in history and raises that person to fulfill a particular responsibility, if that chosen person or family or nation accomplishes their responsibility, then God's will is achieved and history moves closer to the fulfillment of the purpose of creation. However, when the chosen central figure falls short or fails, God's will is frustrated, history prolonged, and God must work to rebuild the foundation and call another central person in a later age to accomplish the same responsibility. Thus, we can see parallel periods in the providence of restoration, which we've been looking at. In our last presentation, for example, we saw clear parallels between the 2,000-year history of Israel, preparing for the coming of Jesus, which ended with the tragic rejection by the very people who'd been longing for the Messiah. And Jesus went to the cross, claimed spiritual victory, brought spiritual salvation. And the parallels between that period and the 2,000 years of Christian his history since Jesus in preparation for Christ's return. Now today we're going to focus in on the last 400 years of this 2,000 year providence of Christianity and look at the final preparation period for the second advent of the Messiah. Now since Christianity has the central responsibility to prepare the foundation for Christ's return, then we've been looking at that particular history and particularly in recent years in European and later American history. Now, uh, particularly today, we're going to be looking at ideological perspectives and philosophies and, and religious uh, interpretations and their connection with economic and political and social events in the history of Christian civilization, primarily in Europe. For those of you unfamiliar with these topics or this history, I urge you not to be uh, bored or, or uh, disinterested, but rather consider this an introduction to these histories that still can provide for us new insight into the parallels, the process, and the providence of restoration. So let's begin. We're going to discuss the period of preparation for the second advent of the Messiah. As I mentioned in our earlier presentation, we looked at the 2,000 year period of Israelite history in preparation for Jesus and how it paralleled the 2,000 years of Christian history leading up to our time. The Old Testament age was consisted of 400 years of slavery in Egypt, 400 years of tribal leadership under the judges, 120 years of a united kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon, followed by 400 years of divided kingdoms of north and south, then a 210-year period of Babylonian captivity, exile, and return, then beginning from Malachi, Ezra, and Nehemiah, the final 400-year period leading up to the coming of Jesus. Likewise, in the Christian era, we could see striking parallels, the 400 years of persecution in Rome, which culminated in 392 when the emperor of Rome, Theodosius, made Christianity the Roman religion. Then a 400 year period of regional church leadership under the patriarchs, which ended with the crowning of Charlemagne 
in 800 AD on Christmas Day. Then 119 years of Charlemagne's royal line seeking to build the Holy Roman Empire. When Charlemagne's empire was divided in 919, it began a 400 year period of divided empires, the East and West Franks and the great schism of Christianity between Roman Catholic and Orthodox. Then a 210 year period of papal exile and return, followed by beginning from Martin Luther's Reformation, a 400 year period of preparation leading to the threshold of the 20th century, the end of World War I, and the establishment of the Communist Revolution. So we're going to look at this 400 year period in closer detail and understand its meaning and how God has been working providentially to prepare the foundation for the accomplishment of his purpose of creation through the building of a foundation, global foundation for the Messiah through Christianity. This period of preparation for the second advent of the Messiah was the 400 year period from the Protestant Reformation in 1517 until the end of World War I in 1918. Now, with respect to God's providence of restoration, we can divide this era into three distinct periods. First, the period of the Reformation, when two movements arose, both seeking to recapture the traditions of Western civilization. One was a cultural movement, the Renaissance. The other, a more spiritual movement, the Reformation. They worked together to break down the dogmatic control of the medieval church and to undermine the corrupt feudal society of the medieval period. The second period of this 400 years was a period of religious and ideological conflicts where through these two movements, Renaissance and Reformation, which undermined the dogmatic control of the church, now there was a freedom of thought and interpretations of the Bible and new philosophies developed reflecting these two movements and these different ways of looking at life and evaluating what was true inevitably came into conflict. The third period is the period of maturation of politics, economy, and ideology. When these two movements matured into ideological movements that developed hardened political and economic systems. Let's look first at the period of the Reformation from 1517 to 1648. This 130 year period of the Reformation began in 1517 when Martin Luther initiated the Protestant Reformation in Germany and it lasted until the wars of religion were settled by the Treaty of Westphalia at the end of the Thirty Years War in 1648. Let's consider the background that gave rise to this period. When God's providence through medieval society was not fulfilled, and remember that God wanted to realize unity between the kings and the popes during this Christian era. That unity and a united Christian tradition around them would have been a foundation of substance for the Messiah. However, the kings fell into corruption and ultimately even papal Christianity failed and became corrupt. Therefore the direction of God's work and providential history shifted to establish anew the foundation for the returning Christ through the Renaissance and Reformation, these two movements. In the late Middle Ages, people's original minds were repressed, their free development blocked by the social environment, the corrupt and oppressive environment of feudalism, and the secularization and corruption of the Roman Church. Medieval Europeans were prompted by the impulses of their innermost hearts to break down their oppressive social environment and open the way for the restoration of their own original nature to express themselves fully and freely. This was the spirit that gave rise to these movements. Now as people pursued the recovery of both the internal spiritual aspects and external physical aspects of their original nature, the thought of the age branched out through two specific movements. Now these two movements both sought to recover the heritage of Western civilization. But we can distinguish them in relative terms as more able type and more cane type. The first movement was the elder brother. It came first. 
in the 14th century began. This Cain-type movement began as a revival of Hellenism, the ancient classical civilization of Greece. This movement gave rise to the Renaissance. Renaissance is the French word for rebirth, and it was so named because it was considered a rebirth of classic Hellenic civilization. The core value of this movement was humanism, the dignity of man, the beauty of nature, and the happiness of man's life in the world and pursuit of the good life. The Younger Brother movement, the second movement which followed this Abel type movement began as the revival of the Hebraic heritage of Israel, a search for a more sincere and genuine and righteous faith. This was the Reformation and seeking for the spirit of the early Christian church. It gave rise to the Protestant Reformation whose core value was faith in God. Large numbers of Europeans were serfs. They labored six days a week for the wealth of their feudal masters and lords. They were, they were pressed into labor from very early in childhood. They worked hard for the sake of others. They owned nothing or very little. They traveled almost nowhere. They most could not read or write. There was little to inspire and free or liberate their original nature. On the seventh day, they worked six days a week. On the seventh day, they would enter the church where they would be told that the reason they suffered on earth was because of sin. And this would be their lot in life. But when they would die, they would go to a better place and experience joy and happiness with Jesus. This was the situation for many. Now, there were others who were artisans or merchants or scholars, etc. And although they might have had a better living situation, they had no freedom of thought for the medieval church controlled every aspect of belief and process in European civilization. In the meantime, the church leaders were often extremely corrupt. Popes kept armies, ordered assassinations, controlled vast amounts of lands, swindled money, made backroom political deals, had illegitimate children. There was a tremendous problem of corruption within the church. The spiritual tradition founded uh, upon Jesus and the saints is a beautiful and empowering tradition that gave life to Christian people. But the earthly church, once it became wedded to the power of the state in the fourth century through Constantine and Theodosius and others, it has been constantly vulnerable to corruption and attack and becoming uh, uh, worldly and materialistic. This has been a tremendous problem. The original mind, which desired to be free, has two aspects. There's the inner desire of the original mind, as we've studied, which seeks for piety and, and faith and duty and is expressed through religion, a deeper inner life and connection with God. But there are also external desires of our original nature for reason, for rights, for individual value, for understanding life in the world and experiencing a good life in the world and a pleasant environment. These are both aspects of the original nature. And these two desires gave rise to the two movements that we're speaking of, the Renaissance and the Reformation. Now, at the same time, these two movements reflected two historical streams of Western civilization, the Hellenic based on the civilization of Greece, and the Hebraic, based on the civilization of Judaism. Before we go forward to explain these 400 years, just a word about these two civilizations. The Hebraic civilization of ancient Israel was definitely a God-centered civilization. This humble people, living in a desert homeland, having very little externally, suffered and struggled much, and looked toward Almighty God as their deliverer and their hope. With little external development, their inner tradition formed much of their value in life. And they longed for the Messiah who would liberate them. God was a righteous, almighty, and just God. And man's responsibility was to make himself in the image and likeness of God. Truly a more theistic, internal, and God-centered culture. However, the other important aspect of Western civilization that came from Hellenic Greek civilization was in some ways quite different. The Greeks were more cynical. They were focused less on the other world and the next life and more focused on happiness and fulfillment in this life. 
Greek gods, if you study Greek mythology, were often jealous and deceitful and rebellious and competitive and manipulating the events on earth through people to fulfill their own selfish goals. In many ways, the Greek image of gods were in the image of fallen people. So as a result, Greek culture focused less on the divine and more on the dignity, beauty, and divinity in man. Greek art idealized the human form and created great beauty. The Olympics also were idealizing the physical capacities of human beings. Greek civilization produced the foremost developments in medicine, in architecture, in political development, in social structure, and in mathematics, and so many uh, aspects of science and technology. It was genuinely a more man-centered, external, and humanistic civilization. These two streams also gave rise to these two movements that led to the last 400 years. Let's take a look. Let's first look at the Renaissance and how it arose. The Renaissance grew out of the external pursuit of man's original nature, reason, and relationship with the external truths of the environment and the world. This movement to revive the ancient heritage of Hellenism caught fire. Renaissance humanism thus rose to prominence. The Renaissance came to life in 14th century Italy, which was the center to study classical Hellenic heritage. Actually, the Crusaders in the Middle Ages had brought back from the Middle East ancient Greek classic art treasures. And this stimulated a movement of culture. It was originally a cultural movement in art, in music, in opera, and focused on the beauty of life in the world and sought to recapture this spirit. Though it began as a movement imitating the thought and life of ancient Greece and Rome, it soon developed into a wider movement to encompass every aspect of society. It created a genuine movement for social and scientific and cultural change. In fact, the Renaissance became the external driving force for the construction of the modern world, the pursuit of the good life, the desire for understanding of our environment, the, the, the appreciation of the beauty of nature and the dignity of man and the worth of the individual. All of these gave rise to the political, scientific, technological, and social development that has shaped our modern world beginning from Western Christian civilization. Now let's look at the Reformation, its companion movement. As medieval Europeans sought to realize the external aspirations of their original nature, they also began to pursue its repressed internal aspirations. The Renaissance had opened the way for reform. There had been earlier efforts to reform the church in the 13th and 14th centuries. Men like John Wycliffe, who who challenged the church which wouldn't allow the Bible to be read by the average parishioner and kept it in traditional remote languages. He translated the Bible, pr proposed for it to be spread and made available to everyone. Wycliffe was shunned and 30 years after he died, his body at the direction of the church, his body was dug up and burned at the stake and he was excommunicated. Jan Hus, a reformer who followed Wycliffe also sought to create reform, but was excommunicated and burned at the stake. But now, with the rise of science and the development of the Renaissance, the dogmatic control of the church was now being undermined. Galileo and Copernicus had shown that the earth was round, not flat, that the earth went around the sun and not vice versa. The church, which had opposed this, and with this newfound freedom, the movement for reform could catch on. So the reformers called for the revival of the early spirit of Christianity when believers zealously lived for the will of God, guided by the words of Jesus and the apostles. The spark that brought this movement was to raise funds to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The Pope began selling indulgences, which church doctrine affirmed would remit the penalty for sin in the next life. In other words, if I made a donation, I would receive a signed document that guaranteed that I or a loved one would have less time suffering in purgatory as a result of my offering. 
When this indulgence was proclaimed in Germany in 1517, a movement to protest its abuse ignited a fuse which exploded in the Protestant Reformation under the leadership of Martin Luther. Luther had translated the Bible into his native German and made it available. Luther now analyzed 95 points where the church doctrine was going against and contradicting the scripture. He put these together in his 95 theses. He tacked them on the door of a church in his native Wittenberg and he said, here I stand, I can do no other. As a result, the flames of reformation grew strong and soon spread to Switzerland and France and England and Scotland and the Netherlands with all of these many other reformers. Now, as Protestantism arose, it was opposed by traditional Catholic powers, churches, and governments. And so wars resulted. And the wars of religion, which swirled around the Protestant movements, continued for more than 100 years until 1648, when the Treaty of Westphalia ended the Thirty Years' War. So together, these two movements had worked together. One, a cultural movement, the, Re the Renaissance, and another, a spiritual movement. They had worked together to break down the dogmatic control and the corrupt institution uh, of the medieval church and feudal society. Now, both of these movements were reactions against this medieval period. However, you can see that the elder brother, the Renaissance, one of them, was moving away from God, away from the tradition of faith, and searching for the meaning of life in the world and centered on human beings and the good life. Whereas the Reformation was searching for a deeper, truer, more authentic faith and a personal experience with God. Let's continue. The period of religious and ideological conflict is next. This period of religious and ideological conflicts refers to the next 140 years, which began with the secure establishment of Protestantism through the end of the Thirty Years' War and ended with the French Revolution in 1789. Now, of the original nature, they could not avoid divisions in theology and disputes among philosophies arising from the newfound freedom of faith and thought. The Renaissance and Reformation together had successfully undermined the authority of the medieval church. Now, in that free environment, in new interpretations of the Bible, differing philosophies and, and contrasting perspectives, reflecting these two views of life, arose and came into conflict. As we see this development, we can see that Cain-type and Abel-type views of life developed during this period. Let's consider the Cain type, more external and worldly view that arose out of the Renaissance. The pursuit of the external aspects of the original nature, as we've discussed, first aroused a movement to revive ancient Hellenism and gave birth to the humanism that was expressed in the Renaissance. Renaissance humanism opposed medieval culture and sought to establish a new perspective on life. The, the beauty of life in the world, the glory of nature, the dignity of man, etc., turning away from traditional church dogma. As a result, the Renaissance elevated the dignity of the human beings and the value of nature. It sought to understand these through reason and experience, logic and experiment. Spurred by the progress of natural science, this perspective, this view of life, gave rise to two schools of modern philosophy. Rationalism, based on the deductive method, and empiricism, based on the inductive method. Let's consider these two. First of all, rationalism, based on reason and logic. Rationalism is based on the mind's capacity to deduce truth through logic. An example of deductive logic would be this. Statement A, all men have noses. Statement B, Reverend Shanker is a man. Therefore, statement C would be the logical deduction that Reverend Shanker has a nose. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with this method of logic. We've been using it throughout our lecture series. But the, the rationalists were dogmatic and absolute about the fact that this was the only way that truth could be 
ascertained and verified. They were reacting against the tradition and dogma and doctrine of the church, saying the only way you can know truth is what your mind can deduce. Rene Descartes was an early champion of rationalism. And so it was extreme in this sense. And Descartes, for example, said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Which really means this, I can doubt anything. I can doubt that this camera in front of me exists. I can doubt that this studio around me exists or the board behind me exists. I can doubt everything except one thing, that I am aware that I'm doubting. So I know I'm thinking, so I know I exist. And this rather complicated process of logical deduction became the basis of modern philosophy. Deductive logic is the basis of modern philosophy. And in their extremes, they, in, in its extreme, it tended to denigrate and deny tradition, dogma, and doctrine, preferring to rely only on the power of the human mind to deduce truth. Now let's consider empiricism, the second view. It's based on inductive reasoning. And that's the power of the mind to experience the mind is a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And the only things that we can determine as true are the things we've experienced based on our interaction with the environment and our sense experiences. Now, an example of inductive logic would be this. Hmm, there's a man and he has a nose. Well, there's another man. He has a nose. Man number three has a nose. Eventually, I come to the conclusion that all men have Noses, based on what? Experiment and experience. Now obviously, inductive reasoning is the basis of modern science and experimentation. And its early champions were men like Francis Bacon and John Locke. Now there's certainly nothing wrong with examples and experience to prove a point. We've been doing that from the beginning of our lecture series. But in the extreme, the empiric empiricists were reacting against the mysticism of the church and its spiritual authority. And so they tended to denigrate anything that was not ascertained by the mind's own experience and, 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 and impre sense impressions. So they tended to uh, deny revelation, mystical experiences, intuition and, and inspiration and insight. And anything that couldn't be ascertained by experience was not important. So God became not so important. Spirituality became not so important because it couldn't be experienced by the senses. Now, the Renaissance launched these two currents of thought which were rooted in humanism. So as a result, instead of facilitating the internal inclination to see God, this gave birth to a view of life that encouraged people to follow only more worldly, material, external, sensory pursuits. Therefore, this blocked their path to God, led them toward a more materialistic, external, and ultimately self-centered existence in the realm dominated by Satan. For this reason, we refer to it as a Cain-type view of life. Now, this Cain-type view broke down the truths that were enshrined by history, tradition, and church authority. People's energies now were more narrowly directed toward the good life, life in the world and improving it and experiencing it toward the practical life. This basic perspective was the ideology of the Enlightenment, which developed out of these two trends of empiricism and rationalism. The Enlightenment was a burst of new philosophical insight based on the human mind's ability to deduce truth, centered on the human capacity to figure out the truth all by ourselves. Some examples of enlightenment philosophy would be atheism. If I can figure out everything by science, and if it's all based on what I experience and my logic, then I don't need God to explain the mysteries of life. But also deism which from, from uh, 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 Lord Herbert in, uh, uh, in England and others, which recognized that obviously this magnificent universe had to have been designed and created. But whoever did that must be gone because there's no personal God interacting with human life or history. Uh, another example was materialism, another enlightenment philosophy. Uh, men like Ludwig Feuerbach, 
Man is nothing more than an animal descended from the, an evolutionary process. And all of his thinking and inspirations and ideas and joy and laughter are just electrochemical impulses in the brain. And our memories and our beliefs are just our interaction with our external environment. Man is nothing more than an animal. And anything spiritual is a product of matter. Now, arising out of this perspective came a number of other philosophical mu movements that led ultimately right into the 20th century. For example, existentialism. If we are the product of evolution, life is an accident. If there's no transcendent ideals and no God, then life has no meaning other than the meaning you give it. So embrace the world, enjoy life, have a tremendous experience for you are the one who determines its value and worth. Now that influenced many artists and writers like Hemingway and Faulkner and others in the Western world. But ultimately it led to despair and confusion and, and spiritual crisis in the lives of many of its strongest proponents. Out of materialism, the movements in psychology were impacted. Men like Freud, who said we are animals and it's our animal impulses that really define who we are under the thin veneer of culture and civilization. Uh, Skinner and behavioralism said that human beings can be taught to act and react by stimulus and response in the same way as you would train an animal because after all human beings are only animals. Now in the political sphere the Cane type view of life which budded after the Renaissance and grew through the Enlightenment into atheism and materialism matured into the godless ideology of Marxist communism. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels took the materialism of Feuerbach and took an idealistic philosophers uh, from George Hegel, the idea of the dialectic, and turned it on its head, developed a philosophy that justified violent revolution and class struggle, and denied the spirituality of human beings, and saw God and religion as a tool of the rich to oppress the lower classes, and made the foundation for the development of Marxism and communism. Now let's consider the development of the able type view of life during this period. In fact, the original nature not only pursues external values, it also seeks internal values. Many modernists have made the mistake of believing that science and philosophy and technology are determining the modern world and religion belongs in the past, the era of mysticism and superstition and dogma and blind belief to answer questions we couldn't figure out. And now that we have science and modernism, we don't need those antiquated uh, uh, belief systems. But in fact, we'll see that this period included also many spiritual renewals and a second reformation and a great awakening and that there is an irrepressible desire in human beings, in modern human beings, to understand the meaning and value and purpose of life, which can't be answered by science. Science can only tell us how. It can never tell us why. Marx was convinced that the development of science would eventually put religion in the dustbin, in the garbage can of history, as science would show all the answers to all the external problems and a perfect material universe but in fact, 20th century science undermined Marx's materialistic view. Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics and the awareness of, of geneticists that every human being living on Earth is related, has a common ancestry. And the Big Bang theory and its metaphysical suggestions, what it suggests metaphysically about life, all of these lend themselves to a more spiritual view and more harmony between science and religion. Einstein said, felt it was impossible to look at the elegance and the order and the beauty of the universe and not recognize the hand of a creator. Einstein felt that science was a surer path to God than religion. So let's look at how this internal, more able type view of life developed in this modern era. As medieval people were prompted by their original nature to pursue internal values, a movement arose to revive Hebraism, which, as we've learned, bore fruit in the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation spawned 
a variety of dogmas, doctrines, interpretations, denominations, uh, uh, religious teachings, and philosophies which developed a multi-dimensional view of life, all of them seeking to realize the God-given original nature of human beings. So we call this the able type view of life because even as the Cain view was leading people away from God and faith and toward a more humanistic uh, fulfillment in the world, this able type view guided modern people to seek God in a deeper and more thoughtful way, to seek for a more genuine faith, a truer understanding of the truth, and a more personal experience with a living God. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant pioneered this able type view of life in the philosophical sphere. Kant, in his critique of pure reason, analyzed and showed that we cannot limit the definition of a human being to merely what we experience with our senses or what we can deduce with our intellect and logic, that there are profound inner aspects, moral and spiritual, that define us and that go beyond these definitions and that to deny them denigrates the human being. Kant laid the foundation for the German idealistic school. He was succeeded by a number of idealistic philosophers, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, and others. All of them affirmed that the, the teleological view of the universe, that life has, seems to be purposeful, that there's direction and purpose and order, and they all recognize that human history is moving in a direction, guided by an absolute spirit. Their idealistic perspective, which said that idea and value and purpose was first, and material followed, it laid the foundation for affirming the existence of God and the spirituality of the human being. Now, likewise, in the religious sphere, there were religious movements emerging which opposed the prevailing influence of rationalism and church authority and dogma in religion and instead stressed the personal believer's experience with God, the importance of religious zeal and the inner life. These were movements like pietism in Germany, Methodism, and the Quakers. They all emphasized the inner life. They all emphasized having a mystical, personal, spiritual encounter, meeting God, meeting the Holy Spirit. In the meantime, the Great Awakening roared through Europe and America, where preachers would hold huge tent meetings, revival meetings, and believers would come and have a powerful spiritual experience with the Holy Spirit, with the living God, led by people like uh, George Whitefield from England, or Jonathan Edwards from the United States. Now, at the same time, as this able type view of life was maturing, it laid the basis for forming the democratic world of today. Now, let's be clear. Democracy would not have developed without the Enlightenment ideals of the value of the human being, justice and rights, and the responsibility of government and so many other aspects. But any effort to create a democratic government that did not, that failed, to recognize the spirituality of man, to allow the freedom of worship and honor that aspect, in every case ended in despotism and totalitarianism and oppression. So the foundation of modern democracy was a beautiful marriage between enlightenment ideals and the Christian spirit. This is that second period that developed these divergent philosophies and views of life. Let's now look at the third period of maturation of politics, economy, and ideology from 1789, the French Revolution, until 1918, the end of World War I. At the outset of this new period, which we call the period of maturation, where there was the development of ideological movements that hardened into political and economic systems reflecting these two views of life. These two views matured, taking their separate paths as we see them developing into hardened political and economic systems. As they matured, they founded two different forms of society with distinct social structures, a Cain-type society and an Abel-type society. This period lasted from the French Revolution through the Industrial Revolution to the end of the First World War. These two views established a Cain type and an Abel type of democracy, which eventually matured into the communist world and the democratic world, which confronted each other throughout the 20th century. Let's first consider the rise of Cain type democracy. Those espousing a Cain type view of life championed the French Revolution. 
thus establishing Cain-type democracy. It blocked the inclination of the human spirit to seek for God. The leading thinkers behind the French Revolution, men like Diderot, D'Alembert, Rousseau, and Marat, they adhered to atheism and materialism. They stirred the resentment of the working class people against not only the state but also the church and religion. They saw the religious leaders as a tool of oppression. And so an excessively bloody and violent and riotous revolution took place in which many of the political and religious leaders were put to death without due process. Because of this spirit, despite its ideals, the French Revolution's actual course tended toward totalitarianism. Once the revolution was complete, the revolutionaries began to turn on each other. Counter-revolution followed counter-revolution. Thousands were put to the guillotine and beheaded in, in the name of being enemies of the people. And soon it depended on whose political alliance that you were part of, whether you survived or not. Ultimately, this bloody process and the reign of terror where heads rolled, if you've heard that, that uh, saying, it comes from the French Revolution. Ultimately, it ended in a more severe dictatorship under Napoleon than the government that they had tried to overthrow in the first place. And this is the model of virtually every Marxist revolution that followed in the succeeding centuries. So as it continued to develop with its sole focus on the external aspect of life, this Cain-type democracy would later be system systematized into Marxism in Germany, Leninism in Russia, and eventually forming the communist world. Marx provided the ideological and philosophical foundation to justify revolution. But his idea would have ended in a, in, in, in a bookshelf if it wasn't for Lenin, who provided the practical techniques for fomenting revolution within society. And this is the foundation for Cain-type democracy. Now, let's consider the rise of Abel-type democracy. From their very origins, the democracies which emerged in England and the United States were different from the democracy born out of the French Revolution. The English and American democracies were founded by genuine and sincere Christians, the fruit of the able type view of life. And they were born out of the fight to win religious freedom. Hence, they are able type democracies. Now, these efforts, these movements, the first two efforts to make a, a revolution in Europe, the Puritan Revolution and the Glorious Revolution, both of them were not against the church, but they sought to establish and maintain the ideals of Christianity even while seeking representative government and political rights for all. Now both of these efforts at creating a Christian democracy fell short. But out of them eventually arose a third that happened in America, the American Revolution. And here in the U.S. Declaration of Independence you can see the transcendent ideal, the God-centered perspective that became the foundation for American democracy. We hold these truths to be self-evident, meaning universal and apparent to everyone. That all men are created equal and that they are endowed not by the state or by the government but by their creator with certain unalienable rights and to secure these rights governments are instituted among men. What a revolutionary concept that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state but from the hand of God. And that the purpose of government is to secure and protect God-given rights. This was the foundation of able-type democracy. Many Puritans and dissenting Christians who had been persecuted in England emigrated, crossed the ocean to the American continent to obtain religious freedom. They became pilgrims for their faith. As they crossed, they saw themselves in the position of the Israelites wandering through the desert seeking for the promised land. Now many different kinds of people came to America, but America's political and spiritual tradition came from this root and this core, and the founding fathers inherited that foundation. They founded an independent nation in 1776 and established American democracy. This able type of democracy has developed from these beginnings into the democratic world of today. Now, make no mistake, these founders were flawed. 
and the system they created fell short in many ways, but there was no greater sin than the fact that the American political tradition allowed and justified slavery and inequality. The fact that, the, that though the Declaration of Independence had said all are the actual Constitution for the purposes of deciding representative government judged every African American slave as worth three-fifths of a white American. This injustice was a profound blemish on the history and tradition of America, one of many. Thomas Jefferson, a Virginia slave owner who wrestled with this question all of his life, felt that a just God would not allow slavery to continue. And he said that if the American tradition of slavery wasn't ended, that God would judge this country. Just 80 years later, Abraham Lincoln, in his second inaugural address, suggested that that was the reason why the Civil War had arisen, as a condition of indemnity, to use the principal term, a payment in blood, a payment in sacrifice for the injustice of slavery. The Civil War might have arisen for a number of reasons uh, out of the struggle over states' rights and economic issues, but it was ultimately spiritually about one thing, to separate good and evil and purify America from the sin of slavery. Like Israel of old that was divided, like Abraham's offering that had to be separated, America too became divided over this issue as a condition to purify this country. Now, Let's talk about the significance of democracy. But before I do, I need to introduce to you the concept of how the, an ideal society is actually the reflection of an ideal person who is in relationship with God. In an ideal person, cells combine to form tissues which harmonize to form muscles or bones or nerves or organs. And these function as systems to make a harmonized body. Now there are three vital systems, heart and circulatory, stomach and digestive, and lungs and respiratory. These are like important functions in society, like executive and legislative and judiciary. But all of these different systems work together and in harmony because they're guided by the brain and connected through the central nervous system. Now the nerves go everywhere in the body so that our entire body is connected. Which is why, if you have a paper cut, your whole body feels it. If you have a splinter, or a hangnail, or a toothache, your whole body suffers over the suffering of any one part. Likewise, a healthy body has good economy, production, distribution, and consumption. And if any one of those are out of balance, the body becomes sick. Likewise, an ideal society should function in much the same way. Cells are like people. people come together in families. Families are part of different organizations in society, whether they are economic or social or religious or what, entertainment, whatever. Then these function together and there are certain vital functions that keep the society together like executive, judiciary and legislative. But ultimately what should make an ideal society work well and function properly is the fact that the nervous system is connected to every part of the body, meaning every single individual has in maturity a connection to the purpose and plan of God. The brain, or God, is connected to everything through that central nervous system. So we would feel the suffering of our brothers and sisters. We would be connected with everyone and the economy would be in balance in the way that our physical body is in balance. Based on this, let's consider the significance of democracy and the separation of powers. The concept of the separation of powers into three branches of government was advocated first by Montesquieu, a leading Enlightenment thinker. From the beginning, the separation of powers was to be characteristic of the political structure of an ideal society, which God has been working to realize. It sought to prevent the concentration of political power in the hands of a single individual or institution, as was the case with political absolutism. So with the establishment of constitutional democracy, the framework for a harmonized and ideal political system was set up. The problem is, in the same way as individuals are disconnected from God, in a human society composed of such individuals, we are like a disconnected body. So because of the fall, Today's democracies cannot fully display their original qualities nor function at their full potential. Why? Because currently the three branches of government 
function like internal organs which cannot sense or respond to the commands of the brain. They lack order, they lack harmony, and they suffer conflicts among themselves. We find society falling apart. We see cancer as one part of society turns on itself or on others. We see all kinds of inequalities and injustice because the society is out of sync with its natural purpose and relationship with God. The three branches of government in the ideal world will interact in harmonious and principled relationships when they follow God's guidance as conveyed through Christ and when people are all connected to God and become people of God then our systems and our social expressions will reflect that ideal. Next the significance of the Industrial Revolution and the rise of Western Christian society. God's ideal of creation is not just about getting rid of sin. It can't be fulfilled merely by forming a world without sin. Also, God blessed human beings to have dominion over the universe. We are meant to live a joyful life. We are to seek for the hidden laws of nature and advance science and technology, harness the power of nature, and utilize it for the benefit of society to create a pleasant living environment, not for a few, but for everyone. So that's the external purpose external goal. Now the Industrial Revolution had this purpose. We can understand that the Industrial Revolution, which began in England, arose out of God's providence to restore a living environment that was suitable for the ideal world. Industrial Revolution served an internal purpose as well. It opened up vast territory for the propagation of the gospel. Accordingly, this Industrial Revolution in England contributed to both the internal and external aspects of the providence of restoration. Let's look at that a little more closely and consider the rise of the great powers. Following the Industrial Revolution, spurred by the rapid progress of science, industrialization created economies that were characterized by overproduction. The great powers of Europe felt an urgent need to pioneer new lands, both as markets for their products and as sources of raw materials for their factories. These countries grew strong as they competed with each other for colonies. Now, tragically, these colonial and imperialist nations went to the world in the name of Christianity with the gospel. But because much of what happened was exploitation, much of what happened was economic and political and because rather than respecting the native cultures and lifting them up and spreading the blessing that God had given to the Christian world, it became instead using and abusing. As a result, the China closed its doors to Western civilization. Japan closed its doors to Western civilization. And in the colonies in Africa and South America and other parts of the world where there had been much exploitation, communism arose out of resentment, out of the conviction that, that capitalism was a tool of the white man's oppression. Now, it was British historian Toynbee who said that communism is a bill of accusation and an indictment against the failures of Christianity. In other words, Jesus had said, when he returns, he'll separate sheep and goats based on how we've loved and served our brother. The promise of a good world and the responsibility of Christianity to to pass the blessing to the rest of the world fell short. As a result, communism arose saying, don't look to heaven, don't look to God. Religion is just a tool of oppression. Religion is just a corrupt system to oppress the people and keep them from rising up and claiming what's rightfully theirs. This has unfortunately been the legacy of the last 400 years as well. And you'll see that it rose, it led to the great world wars of the 20th century, which we'll talk about in our next presentation. So, these two factors, the Cain and Abel trends in ideology and the economic development that followed the progress of science caused the later political division of the world into two blocks, the democratic world and the communist world. These imperialist nations over the last 400 years arose and ultimately World War I was initiated not only by the political events in Austria and Serbia, etc., but the struggle for colonial uh, 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 empires and and markets and such things. Then the Second World War, which arose out of the ashes of the first, ultimately led to the division of the world in the 20th century into these two camps, the democratic and the communist, which we're going to discuss in more detail. Finally, let's consider the religious reforms and how they led to the impact and 
politics and economy and industry. As we look at this final 400 years, the Cain type movement, which began with the revival of Hellenism, overthrew the medieval world and gave birth to the humanism of the Renaissance. As this movement developed further, moving in a more worldly direction, it gave birth to the Enlightenment, which can be regarded as a second Renaissance in the current of ideology. As uh, thought became more humanistic, more man-centered, more philosophical, more external. The Enlightenment thought further matured in the false direction, giving birth to historical and dialectical materialism, which is the core of communist ideology. And this can be regarded as the third renaissance in this movement. Now since the satanic side mimics in advance the providence of God, we can expect that God's providence will also unfold in three stages, in each of the spheres of religion, politics, and economy. Let's take a look. First of all, spiritually. In the sphere of religion, the first reformation took place under Martin Luther's leadership following its elder brother or Cain type movement. The, refer the uh, Renaissance. A second Reformation, the Great Awakening and the Piet Pietist movements and the Methodist movements was launched after the Second Renaissance, the Enlightenment, by the spiritual movements that we've mentioned. Now, from our examination of the progress of history, it's evident that a third Reformation not only will but must occur following the Third Renaissance to bring about the ideal world. It's not enough for Western society to have defeated communism. We can still see crises and struggles and moral dilemmas and the decline of the family. We need a spiritual revolution. Now, let's see how it impacted politics. In the political sphere, we can surmise that reform is also taking place in three stages. We can see that the Renaissance and Reformation together cooperated to break down medieval society. Medieval feudal society collapsed under the weight of the Renaissance and Reformation. Likewise, democracy was formed out of Enlightenment ideals and the Christian spirit. So absolute monarchy was destroyed by the forces unleashed by the Enlightenment, the Second Renaissance, and the Christian spirit of the Second Reformation. Together they formed the foundation of modern able-type democracy, which broke down absolute monarchy. Finally, the communist world arose as the Cain-type democracy, followed by the political revolutions that came about through the communist movement. However, what next has to happen is that through the coming of this ultimate spiritual renewal and third religious reformation, the democratic world on God's side must triumph in the ideological war, bring the communist world to its knees, and together realize Unite and realize the kingdom of heaven on earth under God. And finally, the economic sphere. The economic changes which follow these movements, the religious and political forms, ha reforms, have also been progressing through three levels of industrial revolution. The first originated in England based on the steam engine and coal power, etc. The second, a century later, the second industrial revolution took place in many advanced nations based on the development uh, and harnessing of electricity and the development of the internal combustion gasoline engine. Now, the third industrial revolution that is flowering in our time is created by safely tapping the natural powers of nature, the power of the atom, the power of the sun, thermal power, etc. These will construct a pleasant living environment for the ideal world. So we can see that in the centuries of preparation prior to the Second Advent, the three stages of revolution in religion, politics, and industry for the construction of the ideal world are required by the principle to develop through three stages. In this way, we can see how the world has been prepared internally and externally to realize God's ideal. I deeply appreciate your time and attention. This was a lot of philosophy and ideology and perspectives and history, but I hope that through it you could see that the hand of God is working in the providence of restoration, that we are living in a time that has been shaped by these earlier periods, and we stand on the threshold of the realization of God's kingdom. In our final presentations, we will address and answer the question, how God is working right now. Thank you very much.